Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. Today, we have Andrew Weekly of smithweekly.com on the show. Andrew provides research for his clients on the energy, mining, and natural resource sectors. Andrew's research focuses on the alpha, high risk, high reward, volatile, small market cap companies that may be overlooked or undervalued and underappreciated by the market. Andrew turned the majority of his attention to the uranium market in 2016 when U308 was only $18 a pound. For perspective, now it's 56. It still has his attention, and he believes, like we do, that uranium is one of the best commodities to be betting on right now, if not the best. Andrew, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, Steve, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure, and uh, always uh, like what you're doing in the sector and a lot of work coming out of your channel, so a uh, pleasure to be on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, I enjoy your show as well. Andrew's got a show on uh, YouTube where he interviews a lot of CEOs of uh, of these mining companies and exploring companies. And uh, we'll put a link down in the show notes uh, to his channel and you can check it out. I really like your one by uh, Scott Melby recently. I'm on the third time uh, listening to it. So well done. Yeah, no, thanks, Steve. And, and just just for your, you know, your audience, just just remember that this is a podcast program and that every guest that's on our program, we may not agree with or like. And so just understand that, uh, you know, it's it's a basic program and it's only a very, very small starting point for any type of research and analysis you should do on the sector. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, could you just give us maybe 90 seconds on, uh, on, on your background and then what brought you into uranium? Sure, yeah. So uh, originally from the state of Oregon in the United States, um, uh, when when I was there, uh, my education uh, at the time was University Oregon State University, and and had spent uh, a number of uh, time in business management and obtained a degree there uh, in business management. Then also political science and history was uh, some of the minor work that I did there. Um, as some of the audience might know, that that also New Scale Power originated out of Oregon State University, which is which is an interesting point. Um, from there, uh, most of my time spent in Oregon was with uh, the energy sector, um, predominantly infrastructure and energy maintenance of, of energy infrastructure on the hydroelectric side of things, predominantly. Uh, also a good background in federal government contracting uh, on the construction industrial side. And then also a number of agencies, worked for a number of agencies in the U.S. in terms of a contractor um, having to manage these contracts with various agencies that people would probably understand, like FERC, um, the Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. ACE, uh, BLM, Forest Service. Uh, and so a, an interesting bit of background. And then also just from the investment side, that was kind of a, a stumble on early in my, my days just with uh, investing. And I think the first thing that I looked at in investments back that far was essentially mutual funds. And, you know, from there we've progressed and then became very interested in the natural resource sector in 14 and 15. And then we scraped across uranium via a position in Denison in 2015, and then really started working hard in the sector in 2016 in terms of research. And so that's a little bit of background on me, fairly diverse. I think going back on this, the energy side and my energy connections uh, have actually worked out quite well because of what we've stumbled upon in the recent seven years. And so that's that's a bit on that. On Smith Weekly, uh, we do a couple things. We, we obviously research the sector. We have connections in the broad junior natural resource sector, not just uranium. And then also uh, with that, we provide research back to our membership. Uh, we do have, as you said, a, a podcast program that focuses on the junior sector. And then we also do consulting work in the sector. And with that, uh, predominantly how we look at these positions nowadays, you know, we look at some on-market activity, but we also look at off-market activity in terms of private placements. And so that's that's just a little bit about what we do. And, uh, uh, you know, again, just with the sector, as you said, um, we do have a uranium price that's around $56 a pound today. And we still have very much interest in this sector. And we've been here, as you said, since $18 a pound. So nice catch. I, I only started paying attention when it reached about 45 bucks a pound. And uh, <laughs> so that was, uh, that was good. Okay. Um, 
Can you give us your macro view, your big picture view of the uranium market and why you think it's such a good bet right now? Yeah. Uh, you know, short of bigger things that are beyond this market in this industry, you know, you have the broad market, you have a lot of issues globally, geopolitical issues, economic issues in the world. So obviously that always carries some impact on anything we do with our investments. But um, essentially for us is, you know, while we've had a price increase of uranium um, over the years, we, we still see that the sector is even more so broken today. And by broken, I mean, there's just problems across the board, whether you're talking about the, the mining side all the way to the recycling side. So the complete spectrum of kind of cradle to grave of this industry has so many problems, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's fuel cycle issues, whether it's expertise and skills in the business that are actually needed to make it sustainable. Uh, there's just so many issues uh, with the sector that even if you focus on the mining side and not necessarily the technology side or certain portions of the fuel cycle that you can get exposure to or end user utilities, which typically are, you know, tens of billions of dollars market cap companies that have diverse utility, you know, energy infrastructure that they're involved with, you know, the mining segment of it is very broke and the chain is broke, the supply chain. And so even though we've seen this increase, we've seen no response from the supply chain uh, very little response. You, you see a little bit of restart activity happening in the U.S. You see some of the majors starting to get uh, restart activity going and also maybe looking at new capitalization for new projects and, and building that pipeline. But in general, uh, there hasn't been much response and we're still at a level where most people can understand if you've done the work that uh, $56 a pound doesn't cut it. And so and then you, and you just add the backdrop, which I don't want to beat too much, too many people beat on this, but the the large energy backdrop and, you know, some of the thesis is out there about climate change or, or what have you, um, that this is a really good backdrop. It's not a backdrop that we could have imagined when we entered the sector in 16. Uh, so it's very compelling today. Nothing's been solved, which is why we're still here until we start to see solving of the issues in the supply chain get fixed. Uh, that would be a time when we would consider looking elsewhere, but it still is very compelling today. Yeah, it, uh, it is. <laughs> um, okay. Can you go over the differences between the spot market and the term market? Sure. I think the the basic thing that folks need to understand is this industry is driven on the term market. Um, very rarely are you able to underpin commitments to build projects just utilizing the spot market. Um, so for context, it's it's probably somewhere around the neighborhood of 80 to 85 percent of this market is transacted in the term market, whereas the spot market is a vehicle for uh, you know, various other transactions that wouldn't occur in the term market. And I think as, as people progress in the cycle, you'll notice that we are on the cusp of a notable term contracting market ahead of us, where the spot market will be utilized for certain things, but it won't be as popular as it used to be. The spot market during the bear market has been a lot more utilized for carry trade and, and various other activities. Um, you know, the spot market gets used sometimes also for you know, folks, uh, let's let's pick on Olympic Dam. Um, it's a copper operation, but there's a uranium byproduct. Uh, there's there's certain things that get transacted there. There's trader activity, and the spot market has its uses. But people need to understand that literally 80 to 85 percent of this market is term contract, while the spot market is utilized for trading intermediaries and other things that uh, you know people will reference in terms of price. You know, the spot market is frequently reported in terms of daily price. Uh, whereas the term market is very obscure and you have to dig pretty deep and have a pretty good network to be able to understand where that is. Yeah, and you got to very... have some serious connections to find out what those Correct. are. And it, it's very lag too. I mean, eventually what happens in the term market will show up in financial statements at some point, but it's very lagged. And so unless you have those industry connections, uh, very difficult to get a handle on exactly where we're at. And again, on the term market, from a reporter standpoint, of course, the last thing that's reported is that lowest bid 
uh, for that round of RFPs. And so there's a lot of pieces that go into it, but I think it's just good to say that they both have their uses, but people should really pay attention to the health of this market via term contracting. Okay. All right. And term contract. So like spot price right now is about 56 term contracting could be mid sixties, high sixties, somewhere in, in that ballpark. Yeah. I'll, I'll be traditional and a little bit conservative with you and, and just say that we do think that uh, based on what we've seen and in course correspondence with some of our folks in the sector that, yes, I, I think you could conservatively say it's North of 60. Okay. Okay. And if 85% of those purchases are done, 80 to 85% of those purchases are done on the term market, then when we're looking at some of these physical funds, um, you know, like the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, they're advertising the discount to spot, but that's only 15% of the market or 20%. Uh, the rest is on the term market. So if, if we're looking at that discount, uh, you know, instead of being 10, it could be 14, 15, 16 north of there. Yes, in the sense that there's a lot of pieces that go into what you just said okay. and that, you know, probably don't have the time to get all, into all of them, Steve. But essentially, you know, the, the discount in the physical funds is, is a function of a number of things. First, sentiment plays a role. Um, you know, if someone needs to raise cash, they might sell that fund. So just, just understand that sentiment plays a role in that discount. The management plays a role in that discount. What management says and does and what they get paid and what fee comes off that fund plays a role in the discount. Um, inactivity can play a role. So there's lots of things there and you're, you're absolutely correct in the sense that yes, in these market conditions, is a physical fund a reasonable purchase at this time given the discount compared to, let's just use a number, a date, October 2021. 20, for yeah. example. Yes, you could argue that that's not a bad purchase. Um, but there's other considerations that go into it as well. And so, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not a, a big physical guy in terms of investing in physical. Um, I don't think that's where you get the leverage in this sector. And so, you know, for me, I understand their uses, but you're right. I mean, if one of these physical funds decided to have a contract, a term contract discussion, uh, what would that look like in terms of price and how would that re-rate um, if these vehicles would get active in terms of exercising their options uh, in the case of some of them uh, or in the case to, to, to acquire uh, pounds um, or in this case the sentiment returns or there's activity in terms of using leverage to maybe look at acquiring pounds because it's at a discount. All of these things play into it, but look, at the end of the day, you're going to have periods of discounts and you're going to have periods of premiums. We've seen it already. We're going to see more of it. And so uh, one of these days in the future, we will see these vehicles at a premium. And then each one of these vehicles has different features, which can result in that discount. And so that's the other thing people have to look at. But uh, again, I'll just say it, you know, not terribly interested in physical investments. You, yes, you could pick up one of these funds. You could use... A new vehicle like Zuri Invest, which has other special features, but it has a minimum investment amount, which most folks probably uh, maybe can't do. 100000 I believe, in that case, 100000 USD. Uh, and then there's other things where you can literally pick up the phone and you could call a broker and say, hey, look, I want, you know, 100,000 pounds. Okay, well, what's that going to cost? 5.6 million at, at current prices. So you have to store it and you have to get it accounts with uh, the storage facility, but that's another viable thing, depending on who we're talking to and what the you know financial profile of the, you know, the person taking in this information. So that's, that's my just kind of brief take on it. And I think people have to understand all of those components. And it's not just as easy as doing some, some simple math, you know, on the back of a napkin and, and trying to figure out why it's at a discount. I, I think there's more to it than that. Okay. If I guess so, every, every day that, that, for example, the Sprout Physical Uranium Trust, every day it exists, they got to take management fees. They're not they're not doing this and storing it for free, right? You know, a hundred k a day or something like that. So as their cash position dwindles, they've got this um, caveat that they can't purchase more until it gets you know above a, at a premium. And so we've yep. just been at a discount now for about four or five months or so. What? Um, uh, if it never gets back up to a premium, in other words, because of sentiment or, you know, people just don't buy into the thing, um, 
what what would that i think they got another six or seven months worth of cash or something what would happen in that scenario where it just runs at a discount until they run out of cash is that do you have any idea or yeah so i'm not specifically familiar with the contractual components of that fund um, i'll be honest i haven't looked at it uh, again highlight of my interest i have little um in this case it's a rock and a hard place although I would just say, and again, I don't, I don't know those folks very well, and and you know that is what it is, but I would suspect that they have some other options that are off, you know, off the balance sheet, if you will, to be able to shore that up. I think also that they've been able to learn some good lessons since, uh, call it July 2021, uh, where there was periods of discount in which they understood that it made more sense to keep more cash available because of you know, front running and these other various activities that happen uh, with the traders. And so in this case, um, I, I think that they've learned some of those lessons and they've been able to backstop better. Uh, but but based on their cash balance and, and some of the other things there, I, I think they can survive this out. Um, maybe. There, there's also the potential for greater economic concerns to continue to prolong this, which it's never easy, Steve. This This business, I'll be honest, this business sucks. It's never easy to do anything uh, and, and even raise capital to some degree right now. And so I do think that they have enough support. They have a big group in the Sprott group behind them. I think there's creative ways to pull them out of this if they want to. Um, but in the meantime, I'll be honest, I'm split on the issue. I enjoy a little bit of the pain because for us guys who are able to allocate capital and we've been in this market, we understand the junior natural resource market. We understand the need for capital. And we also understand the need to keep capital that I, I enjoy a little bit of the pain with some of these folks because it, it does spill opportunity for those who are savvy and understand the sector. Yeah. It makes the juniors a lot cheaper. <laughs> um, okay. Let's get into some of the uh, listener questions. Uh, we got one from Scotty. I follow almost daily URNJ, uh, UUUU, and Uranium Energy Corporation. I'm praying for patience and curious which one may be your favorite. Oh, well, I, I could tell you that uh, just just tacking onto my physical fund uh, comments, um, I don't have any, I don't really have any interest either in an index fund. Uh, you know, for a generalist, I guess it kind of works, but uh, we don't have any interest in those. We understand their purpose and we do follow them, but it's certainly not something that I have interest in. So from an index fund standpoint, I, I don't have anything to say there. Um, you know, I, I guess I will say, and this is a little bit supportive because there's nobody in the sector in this in this particular niche of the market. There's literally one company. I will say when you weigh index funds and you weigh physical funds and then you weigh the junior group, whether it's the major producers, whether it's the, the mid-tier folks, whether it's the developers, whether it's the greenfield exploration folks, um, the interesting middle ground to some degree is a royalty company. And, and let's just compare it to the gold sector, for example, the copper sector. You have a, a big amount of competition in the royalty streaming sector over there, but sadly in the uranium sector, there's literally only one company. And so, and I'm not promoting that company. I do think it has a very good CEO uh, that, that does know the sector incredibly well, which ties back to your comments earlier about my recent interview with, with Scott Melby, yeah. uh, which is a good friend of mine. But you know, when people weigh this and say, well, physical doesn't give me enough, the index funds are pretty, pretty junk. They're junk. I mean, they're, yeah. they're just poorly managed. And, and, and all of this is, is it's a fee structure. It's collecting a fee. I mean, it's, it's, it's more or less a joke. Let's just be honest. Um, so when you look at this and you don't want to take the risk with developers, explorers, et cetera, the royalty component is actually quite compelling a little bit. And we've seen that that particular equity can really perform well both to the upside and downside. So I guess to not really answer the question in full, you know, people might look at that. Um, but, uh, you know, index funds, look, we don't do that. I mean, we have individual positions and we form our own internal index fund, which is, uh, you know, highly, you know, large concentrated allocations to a small group. Yeah, you study 
eight to 12 junior ones that you really believe in and you put all your energy into that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd use the word Steve belief, but certainly we, we do a lot of work to backstop our positioning and our position sizing. And so that's, that's what I would say there. And I, and, you know, again, it depends on how much time you have to allocate to the sector. We have a lot of time for it. Um, some people may not have a lot of time. They are generalists. They're, you know, doctors, lawyers, or, you know, doctors, dentists, and, and G degenerates, if you will, if you want to call it that, <laughs> yeah. the triple D in the sense that, you know, they don't have time and, and they, they just want to place money and, and they might choose an index fund or they might choose a research service to, to do that for them um, or, or just a broker. So anyway, those, those are my takes on, on what you asked. Okay. Uh, question from Mark. Standard Uranium announced their new business model. Do they still have a chance to create value or do they join the ranks of Canadian lifestyle companies? What do you see for the company in the next few years? Steve, I will be honest. I don't know the company that well. So I don't have an informed opinion. Okay. Um, you know, I will just say broadly that there are a pile of lifestyle companies in this sector. A matter of fact, it's it's stupidly weighed towards lifestyle companies. Um, I don't know them well enough to have any comment on them, but I will generally say that there's a lot of startups coming in. A lot of them are jokes. Not saying that you can't make money on promotions. Um, you can. If you have a lot of other things right, like the sector stage, the tailwinds, where the sector is going, um, you know, you can still make money on things that will uh, never see the light of day. But uh, in this case, I don't have any comment on that company. I, I don't know it. Uh, and I would just suggest that people really take their time to do due diligence and measure. There's so many things, more than we can cover on this current call, maybe on future calls, but there's so many things you have to look at. You know, how is management incentivized? What's their cost basis? Um, are they escrowed? If it's a new company, are they escrowed? What exchange are they listing on? What's their upside, you know, if they're right? Um, what are they doing in terms of promotion? How capable are they? Um, what's their reputation? There's so many things. And so many times, these companies are self-serving. As a matter of fact, it's so bad that if you're at a cocktail party and you go to the punch bowl, some of these CEOs would rather serve themselves five times over at the punch bowl before the next person in line is able to get the punch. <laughs> and so... That's, that's how bad it is. So you have to find the guys that really want to create value for shareholders. They're actually aligned with shareholders. They understand that they are successful too if shareholders are successful. And they're not so, so blatantly showing that they're self-serving to themselves. So it's a fine line. You have to be incentivized um, and you have to be able to attract talent, which is in some cases incentive related. So overall, I would just say those things, um, but just again, to make sure I'm clear here, I'm speaking generally and that I don't know the individual's uh, conditions or issues surrounding uh, standard uranium. I, I just don't know the company well enough to be able to say anything on that. And so just make sure that you separate the two. Okay. Yeah. That last count, I, I've heard numbers between 119 and uh, 123 as far as how many uh, how many companies we got to choose from. And of that, maybe you can find 10% that uh, is worth betting on. Um, okay. Well from said. Frank, was that? Well said. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, from Frank, do you see a possibility of UEC taking over Peninsula Energy in Wyoming? In other words, what is the best worst alternative for Peninsula? So in, in Wyoming, um, we, there's a plethora of uh, uranium miners, some permitted, some not. Um, the Lance project is the one correct owned by, uh, um, uh, Peninsula kind of up in the North, what would that be? The Northeast uh, part of the state. And, and that's right around a whole bunch of other ones. I mean, chemico has got some in there and, and, uh, um, uh, other projects. Yeah, I, I think this, this one's interesting from the sense that first, I, I just have to offer up to the, the person who asked the question that. Um, this one's a sensitive one and I'm not able to make any comment okay. on, on either company. Um, I would just say, you know, read the news, make your own interpretations. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that have already done that. Um, but I'm, I'm just not in a position to comment either on either management team or the actions of this. 
And so I'll leave it there on that piece of it. Um, and trust me, we've had other questions along the same lines that have come in at, at Smith Weekly as well, and, and we'll have to deal with those in due course. But the the point is, is, is you know, Wyoming is an interesting place in the sense that uh, it's becoming even more interesting uh, ge geopolitically. We, we've obviously just seen news this morning um, on geopolitical events in the sector that continue to call into question jurisdiction and the safety and the risk profile of, of jurisdictions. And uh, so there's there's various comments flying on the airwaves uh, today about that. But Wyoming definitely is a great jurisdiction. It's a proven jurisdiction. There's a few companies there, obviously, that have processing facilities. Um, but again, this business is a pain in the rear, Steve. It's difficult. And there's a lot of things that can be said about some of the recent events there in Wyoming. There's juniors coming into the sector in, in, in that area. There's uh, some incumbents. And so I'm just not sure what the outcome is going to be uh, there, but I can tell you it's a good place to be in terms of the uranium business. But, uh, you know, sorry, I can't offer up much more context for your listener who asked. Okay. Uh, moving on to John. When does replacement rate long-term contracting get rolling? How close to booked up are tier one producers? That's a good question. And it's, it's one that's, somewhat difficult to answer in the sense that you have to also put timeline on what was said and you also have to look at development pipelines for these majors but to the first piece of it i would say that the replacement rate contracting um has kicked off but it but it's going to ramp up and i hate to characterize it that way in the mining sense but essentially it, it needs to ramp up in a way that um I think it's it's here, but I don't think you're going to see the the real numbers show up until a few things get resolved, um, and, and and that generally would fall in the time frame for me of probably 24 through 26 in terms of years. What can impact that to some degree? And and again, we're seeing it looks like we will see another record set today or this year, sorry, in 2023. Uh, with term contracting. So it's very positive in the sense that I do think that, you know, you definitely have an uptick in term contracting. It's all very positive, but I think you'll see some really heavy duty contracting in the years ahead. And so we'll see where t this year lands, but my suspicion is, is we should see somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 150 million pounds transacted in the term market um, this year. I think that's fairly conservative to suggest. Uh, and traditionally with some of the industry events coming up starting in September with the WNA. Um, there's also there's also some weight to be put on, you know, the last uh, quarter and a half of, of the year. And so I do think you'll see some additional activity come in before year end. In addition to that, I think another piece that people sometimes miss is, you know, these are large businesses, they have a lot of costs, they've got a lot of problems. And when, when uh, recession and, and economic fears and stuff like this starts to come in, Utilities, doesn't matter what, what piece you're in, what source of energy you're in, um, there is always the tendency to tighten the belt a bit. And I think some economic considerations will be played. And it's going to be, you know, some, some folks won't have a choice. Some utilities just won't have a choice because of their inventory levels. But some will. Some will have that flexibility to be able to prolong, maybe buy in smaller quantities to be able to patch through. And you got this on the backstop of, or, or I guess the backdrop, if you will, of geopolitical issues. You've got issues coming out of Russia. You've got the Russia-Ukraine war. You've got general energy discussion globally. Um, you've got the climate change narrative, which which we might want to talk about a little bit if you, if you have time, Steve. But in general, I've already seen it in some other segments in the U.S. energy sphere in the sense that Companies are tightening their, tightening their belt in the sense that even maintenance projects get cut. And we're talking maintenance projects of wow. infrastructure. And so I do think, even though some people will want to argue with me, that there is economic choices that will happen because of where we are in the broad you know, stock market and, and economic conditions within the U.S. and elsewhere to where you could see some delays in decisions, fi big financial decisions towards this. Now, let me be clear. Some don't have that option. Others will have the option to, to maybe buy in smaller quantities and kind of patch through. And I think that that is 
very possible. And I think people should be to some degree prepared for that. And so long-winded answer, but in general, I do think that uh, the term contracting has begun well. Replacement rate, you know, kind of adding on top of that standard inventory that's required. I think you start to see this again, depending a little bit on economic conditions. I think you see this 24 through 26. Okay. Okay. Next year to 2026. Yeah. Um, give, give, give or take a small margin, because again, I don't have a crystal ball and I don't profess to be perfect in my, in my uh, future looking uh, things, but I can tell you we've been in this sector long enough. We've done a significant amount of work and we continue to evaluate the sector continuously to, to question our own thesis. But I think that that is a reasonable time frame, and, and I've never been of the case that, that people should, you know, look at this and everything's going to happen tomorrow. You should never have that view. Nothing ever happens on time in this sector and nothing ever goes right in the junior sector. And so I think people have to understand that. And you're going to lose your ass a couple of times um, yeah. on these investments, uh, even the best investors, they'll never admit it, but I can tell you, They've lost their butt on certain investments and they've also lost their butt on timeframes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well put. Um, okay. From Mike, what's his opinion on these announcements from the Nambian government in the last few months? Um, so basically uh, the Nambian government, if I'm not mistaken, they uh, decided like all governments eventually do, they try to <laughs> redistribute wealth. Right. And they, they took uh uh, was it the Rossing mine uh, they got their hand in now out in, in uh, Namibia? Yeah, Steve. So that one, that one I'm not so concerned about. Okay. Um, so looking back and you go back and look at the pieces, you know, Bloomberg did kind of a curb job on, on Namibia and the mining industry there. There was some misinterpretation about the oil and gas sector of which, you know, we know a little bit about in Namibia because of a prior uh, investment that we made there with the company. Uh, in the oil and gas sector. Um, so it, it's, it, it's interesting in the sense that also Namibia, Namibia has its own uh, national, you know, basically national oil company. And so you have to make sure that you go back and, and read some of the pieces. They weren't well informed. On top of that, um, it's, it's never worked out well to, I guess, cut the leg off an industry when it's in, in, the, in the midst or an early stage of a bull market. So it's not like we're nationalizing gold mines like Venezuela did at the, at the peak of a cycle when, when the gold price gets nice and, nice and juicy. Mm -hmm. um, so they, I think the Namibian government, I, I can't speak for them, but I'm just speculating here based on what I've seen, the official news versus comments from people that have operated there for decades. And it's completely different. Um, I am not concerned about this. I think that if the Namibian government wants to look at this, I think that people should consider that free carried interest is fairly standard in a lot of projects that get developed. It wouldn't necessarily, of course, affect exploration activities, but it would potentially affect um, how development companies approach partnership with the government. And as far as I'm concerned in reading the news releases and then reading some of the statements that came out from the Ministry of Mines and, and some of these other folks, um, is that it's it's not concerning in the sense that that is what they intend to do. And I don't think they ever intended to do that. Um, but I think people should just be cautious with the respect to jurisdictions, but also understand that the mining industry in Namibia is very important to the country's economy. So that's tax payments, that's employ in, employment, that's uh, training and wisdom transfer to the local folks there, uh, making the government your partner, and all of those other things um, I think are important. And I also believe that uh, the uranium industry there is very well established. And I think that the, uh, the government understands that you don't uh, you know, cut off the arm that pays you essentially. And so I think it's unfounded. Um, you know, and, and I think to some degree you can see that. I mean, the equities uh, on that news, there was probably two days of weakness in those equities, but then they snapped back. Yeah, they um, recovered. Yeah. So uh, matter of fact, I'm more concerned about other jurisdictions than I am Namibia, to be honest. Um, okay. Namibia is probably hands down the safest uranium jurisdiction um, from all perspectives when I say safe. I mean, talking, you know, safety, personal safety, but also safety with government understanding, structure, profile, influence from other countries. And Namibia is probably one of the best 
jurisdictions uh, in the world through uranium, and you could probably put it somewhere in the top. Uh, you know, there's not many, of course. There's only a handful, but it's definitely um, very comparable to uh, U.S., Australia, and Canada being ahead of it, but probably somewhere around the neighborhood of fourth. Okay. And you know, let me just tie this in again. Niger, uh, there was an issue uh, that came out today. Um, I have not had time to study it. Uh, we don't have any interest in Niger, but it should be studied, and we will study it in due course. But essentially, um, Niger has much more risk associated. And for anybody to put Namibia and Botswana or you know other countries I won't mention in, in Africa um, in the same sentence with Niger probably hasn't visited the countries and probably doesn't understand that well. You can't put Namibia in the same sentence as Niger when it comes to political stability. Okay. Um, it just doesn't work. Um, Botswana and Namibia, just to bring it in, I'll bring in Botswana. Both of these countries have a very robust mining um, infrastructure and political stability in that sense. You've got gold mining, you've got diamond mining, you've got some copper potentially happening here in, the, in those countries. And you also have, and specifically in Namibia, uh, uranium. And so Niger is a whole different animal. I'm sorry to say it. People are going to disagree and they're going to scream and complain in the comments. But the bottom line of it is, is Namibia and Niger are completely different in terms of where they are on the risk curve. And, uh, you know, again, just just travel to Walvis Bay with your family and then travel to Niger with your family. And I think you'll understand the difference. <laughs> Would that be your highest risk uh, jurisdiction? Well, it depends on if we're talking about uranium or gold or what have you. I, I okay. think Niger has its uses, but then there's the other piece. There's the French influence. The French influence in Niger can make an argument that it's, it's declining. And it's hard to say what the French will do here in terms of response. I don't know if there will be a response, but that's that's another issue that's a little bit concerning. I, I mean, again, I, I feel sorry for anybody who's operating there, um, but it's a risky place. But overall... Depends on what what uh, is, Niger is better than say Burkina Faso in terms of gold, but if we're just talking uranium in Africa today, yeah, I would say Niger is probably your worst jurisdiction for uranium. But that's not hard. Let me be clear: it's not hard because there's literally only two. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's 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 a tough one. But uh, you know, people just have to understand. I mean, you can't just lump Africa into a big pot that says high risk. You have to look at individual countries. Um, you know, I, I, again, I just won't mention these other countries by name because I don't want to tip off anybody. But there are some other countries that have a history of very, very stable in, an, in a region that's unstable. And, you know, I'll let people do their own history lessons to kind of sort out which ones I'm talking about. But in the sense of uranium, yeah, I, mean, I think it's just been highlighted that Niger is obviously the higher risk of the two. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, got a question from Jan. She's asking about uh, the reactors in uh, the United States. Stats on the internet suggest most active reactors are in the USA, and most of them are older than 30 or 40 years. So this is a two-part question. Number one, what percentage does the market, what percentage number does the market assume these will be retired in the next five years, percentage of um, gigawatts? And then number two, what percentage will really retire, given the findings that the reactor life extensions are very viable? And then what's the difference between <laughs> number one and two? So number one, what percentage number does the market assume these will be retired in the next five years? Okay, that one's a little bit tough to follow, but I think I get the, I'll, I'll do my best to explain what I think it is. Okay. I'll try to make it in a way that's very simple. First of all, not going to give out too detailed of an answer here because that's stuff that you should do your own work on, and we have, and, and it's just it's not for public consumption. Sorry, sorry about that, um, but that's just how it is. I think what overall, so yes, you've you've got a bunch of aging reactors. Um, you've got about ninety three reactors in the U.S. right now, ninety three, and so I think it's. From 1970 to 1990, it was the bulk of your build-out. 
and that that's that's all true and you do have extensions and you do have uh, some premature shutdowns and and you also have just standard retirements as well that are falling in there um the other piece of of the question that came there which is also difficult because you have to put reactor specifications and reactor size into that equation steve so specifications on enrichment have to come into that equation and then you also have to look at the individual reactors that we're talking about that could be retired or extended yeah and some that's of these are bigger and use more fuel of some course. are smaller and and you got you got to do yes. 93 of these okay correct then go back and take a look over the last call it let's call it 10 to 15 years and you can get together a rough number and again i'm, I'm going to be very i'm going to be vague here and make it simple but let's just say that there's a retirement every one year so one retirement, I think she said five years forward or something like this. Yep. Um, you know, let's just just assume one year retire. Every year there's going to be a retirement. So over the next five years, there's going to be five retirements. Um, now the U.S. doesn't have much of a pipeline, which is for a handful of other reasons, Steve. Which again, you probably don't have the time to go into. But uh, let's just say that the U.S. has not done its job with respect to the. Um, export and also domestic program with respect to its reactors. And so that's a whole different subject and, and involves regulatory and a bunch of other problems. We can fix that, that by sanctioning Russia, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's just a lot of, it's just a lot of political hot air as you can imagine. Um, but back to her question. So you've got, uh, assume just one retirement every year. Um, you can look at the, the demand from some of the extensions, and we're seeing extensions, you know, you can start to factor those into your assumptions as you build those out. And for us, we, we like to keep it a little bit tighter. We like to look, you know, no more than five years out when we look at our, our data and how we put together, you know, our, our overall database on how we look at it. But there's a lot of pieces that go in. So enrichment specification, you've got different reactor sizes. You've got maybe one retirement every year in the U.S. And let's say... On average, again, rough number that these reactors consume, again, rough number, 500,000 pounds each year. So you could do, do a little bit of math there and sort out that, hey, overall, you're going to have, you're going to have growth. It's, it's a growth industry. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves. It's growth industry. Um, but you can put those numbers together based on the parameters I gave you and come up with a reasonable number. Um, but overall, the difference between the two, I, I think that you're probably splitting hairs a little bit. You have to look at this from a global perspective and, and look at all the reactors, not just the U.S., because the U.S., sadly, is not telling the whole story. But the U.S. does have the biggest fleet currently. Now, that'll be surpassed most likely by China in the years ahead. But right now it has the current, you know, the largest fleet. So take those numbers, you know, average of 500,000 pounds consumed per year. You have to look at the reactor size. Then you also have to look at the enrichment specifications and the technology being utilized. But overall, you can make those assumptions and come up with some rough numbers of, of how it would add or subtract uh, to the overall total numbers. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, the climate change narrative. You, you want to give a little piece on that? Sure. I'll make it very simple. We've been in this sector, you know, again, going on roughly seven years. And so we've had to look at energy. And with that comes all these other things that come out. I mean, you've, you've seen personalities, Steve, show up um, in the, in the, you know, the attacks on, on, I guess, various sides. And you, and you see this, this larger narrative called climate change. And before it was called global warming. Um, and when you look at this and, and now, now carbon is coming into it. So, you know, I, I'm not a scientist. I'm happy to say that. I, I haven't studied this terribly amount, but I, I have followed some pretty smart people on both sides. And the fact is, is when we breathe in oxygen and, and the other, you know, gases that, that are, are with us in, in our daily environment, you know, there's carbon. And when we, so there's, there's a trace amount of carbon that we inhale along with oxygen and other things. But when we also exhale, which is the funny part, we, we actually have, you know, there's, there's carbon emitted. That's, that's, that's life. That's the cycle of life, whether you're a chicken or a human being. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the fact. 
So you have to wonder, it, it's just it's just a little bit, it, it's it's questionable in the sense that is carbon really the problem? Because we have to, car, carbon's absolutely emitted by us. Carbon's needed when it comes to plant life and really everything that's living. So I'm trying to understand just a little bit there. You have to you have to actually do some work on this. You can't just trust the pundits that are just blowing hot air. And I can tell you, one of the biggest hot air centers in this world is Washington, D.C. I mean, the amount of carbon that's blown out of these politicians' mouth is is just well, let's see if we can reduce that footprint. <laughs> and so I, I don't know. And again, I've spent a good amount of time. It's been a little bit of a hobby. I am not sure that climate change is about the climate, Steve. I think it's more about control. Yeah. And the more you do work on this and the more you study some of just the basic things that people, most people will not have the time to look into because, you know, most people these days, they, they read a few paragraphs and they, they glaze over and they, they lose their attention. I, I do think that you have to dig deeper on these types of things. You have to question the official narrative. And and I didn't used to believe this, but as as I've gone on throughout my my years um, and seeing this these most recent activities happen over the next or over the last call it seven years since we've really focused on energy. Because we have to question that, you know, when we when we come in and we look at uranium mining as a as a thesis. And the broken nature of that sector, which we we haven't talked about a lot, but trust me, it's broken. It's very broken. <laughs> and things like Russia have continued to break it, and the fuel cycle is broken, and the West capacity for conversion is broken, and enrichment's broken, and you know little things like Orano is going to expand its enrichment capacity at its New Mexico facility. Um, uh, is it really expansion? Because last I checked, centrifuges wear out. They have to be replaced. So a replacement rate of 15%, is that really expansion or is that just replacement of wearing out centrifuges? So not to digress on that. What I'm getting at is, is when we study this thesis, we have to look at the broader narrative with reactors, with fusion, with fission reactions. Um, you know, to some degree, people should go watch uh, this this latest movie that's come out, and I'll, I'll recommend two because I think that they're useful for different purposes because it ties in very good narratives about regulatory, about governments, and a number of other things. But you know, go watch Oliver Stone's um, Nuclear Now. Yeah, take a look at that. I will say that that is a yeah. He did a go, very good job. Go take a look at Oppenheimer. You know, Oppenheimer's interesting. From the sense that, you know, there's there's a change in this character's uh, thoughts through the start of the program to the conclusion and how the government treated him and these types of things. It brings in a lot of things to question. And then also the fact that, you know, there was this end. There one, of, there one of the lessons at the end of it was, is the world going to self-destruct itself with the use of weapons? Well, I can tell you that you know, I haven't looked at these numbers, but I would just venture to guess. And again, haven't looked at the numbers, but my rough guess is, is, you know, the use of those atomic bombs at the time, when you count up the casualties versus the other casualties that we've experienced in various scenarios since that are not using atomic bombs. Let's just compare the casualties from natural disasters or energy disasters, or even things like health disasters, yeah. like, like the last few years we've seen. Yeah. How many people have died from that? So let's let's actually let's figure out how we're how are we really destroying ourselves? So I think take a look at those. They they both offer different pieces. And I was actually pleasantly surprised that 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 movie um, was very interesting. And, and it was just a great time to get away with family. But, uh, you know, those are the things that people need to pay attention to. And you can't just take that broad narrative that someone's jamming down your throat and believe that it's actually true. You can do some basic work and start to figure out, you know, is this really about climate? Is is an electric vehicle a key to prestigious driving around town and saying, I somehow am doing better and supporting the environment than the guy who drives a diesel? Or is that really true? Is is the components that go into an electric vehicle uh, more? It, it, let's, let's take a look at all the minerals and, and so forth that goes into this. The energy needed to produce an electric vehicle you know, the copper, battery technology, lithium, all the other pieces that go into it, steel, iron ore, you know, 
stronger steel and all the different pieces that go into these vehicles. You got to remember, you have to factor in when I when I put a liquid into my vehicle, diesel, or you plug your electric car into the wall, you have to think about the total footprint. And the total footprint is not just, well, my vehicle standalone is the footprint. You have to look at the liquid that goes in or the electricity that goes in and where that electricity comes from. So from an emissions basis, I don't know, I don't know that it's doing any better. I'll be honest. And so, you know, just because you drive an electric car doesn't mean you're better than the person who drives a diesel. Yep. Um, there's a lot of pieces and you have to sit down and break those pieces out. The footprint cradle to grave is substantial. Um, you know, you can't talk about this really without bringing in the wind and solar piece of it. But again, back to the one piece of it here is I think people have to look at all these things. You have to question the official piece. You have to do your own work, sadly, or you have to at least take in both sides and figure out, you know, who, what actually is working here and what's, what's the reality. And so, um, the only way you can do that is to spend a lot of time on it and, and get both sides and actually do some work. And I, and I just am starting to come to the conclusion now that it's not necessarily about the climate, Steve, it's about control. And we've seen various vehicles of control employed um, over the last decade. And it's financial, it's potentially health, there's a lot of other things. And I would just say overall, and this goes back to, I believe it was a, uh, a, uh, a class on history. Question, question the narrative, question the narrative, follow the money, those types of things. It's hard to do, but yeah. you can you can do it. And so when you look at all that, you have to tie all that piece of it together. You have to look at the motivations. You know, why hasn't fission technology improved substantially and become widely adopted since its inception? You know, why is it that the U.S. military, uh, the Navy, uh, with 60 some odd vessels plus have used reactor technology since the fifties. They're powered uh, by this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's doesn't even, it doesn't even they compare. essentially have SMRs on their ships already. <laughs> yes. And so when you look at the waste footprints of everything that happens and the cycle of, of all of this, you have to really question the clean energy narrative too. Yeah. I'm, I'm here to disappoint all your listeners in the sense to tell you that, there is no clean energy. There's no such thing as clean energy. Yes, there's form. There's cleaner forms of energy. There's energy that has less footprint, but every form of energy requires inputs. That's how you get the energy. Yeah. So as inputs are required, there's no such thing as clean energy because there's always some type of dirty footprint that comes into it. So the whole green, clean, and all that stuff, I'm telling you, you have to rethink it. Uh, not not disputing that there's not cleaner forms and better sources of energy. We have a perfect, high quality, high density form of energy before us. Why hasn't it been widely adopted? Well, because people are resistant to change. Wealth and fortune is resistant to change, especially when it's threatened. Yeah. And so you have to take a look back at the history and understand that. And so, you know, we've talked about getting off coal for decades and still coal is what? 10 to 15% of the U.S. grid. Yeah. We've talked about it for decades. We're trying to get off of it. And here it still is with us. And so, you know, none of this changes overnight. And sadly, um, I just would say people have to question and correct when stuff is really coming across false. And so that's what I would say to that. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you asking. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, I'm in the same camp. I think climate change, CBDCs, and the cervasa sickness are all about one thing, and that's control. <laughs> and that's it. Um, well, thank you, Andrew. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, we'll put links down to your uh, website in the show notes and your YouTube channel. Um, any final thoughts you want to give our listeners before we wrap up? No, look, uh, it's been a good conversation. Hopefully it's good enough and, and worthy enough for, for maybe I can come back and talk a little bit more. Um, I would just say, look, uh, as far as we go, um, you can go to smithweekly.com. Um, our services there are waitlisted. Uh, we do look to open it up on occasion. Uh, we're not here to promote our service. We're not. We don't care if you sign up or, or you don't. It, it doesn't matter to us. Our, our business model is very unique in the sense that we don't rely upon, you know, new members. Um, so we're, we're okay with or without you. Um, so 
go and take a look, uh, do your own work, study it. But I would just caution your audience that are, are the investor types. Um, you know, this sector is a nasty sector. It's it's really interesting in the sense that it's nasty and it's also beautiful. And that's a component of individual companies and the individual people in the sector. And so just be careful. You have to do a lot of work. Um, you know, don't just believe everything that's on a YouTube channel, sadly. Uh, and understand the intentions of the people uh, that, that in which they're talking. And that's also a piece that's really important. So approach it with caution. It's very compelling. You know, we like the sector. We also have a lot of negative things to say about the sector and we're right. But at the same time, um, you know, I would just say approach it with caution and pick and choose who you think are sincere people and uh, just be careful out there. And so I would add that and uh, just appreciate your time, Steve. Yes, I appreciate you too, Andrew. Thank you very much. And thank you for tuning in. We will talk to you next time.